Our first topic in macroeconomics will be to study the overall level of economic activity in a macroeconomy. To do that, we're going to look at simply what that means and how we would measure it, uh, giving the pros and cons of how we would measure it, and then diagramming that on something called the business cycle. Sorry about that. So what is macroeconomics? Simply, macroeconomics is the study of how countries try to satisfy their unlimited needs and wants with a scarce amount of resources at the national level, similar to what we talked about with microeconomics. So specifically, though, what do we see occur in macroeconomics that we wouldn't have seen in micro? In macroeconomics, we study the whole of something. So we study aggregate demand instead of individual demand or a firm's demand or, or a customer's demand for a good. We study aggregate demand, which is the, the demand for all the goods in an economy. We also study aggregate supply, which is, again, the supply of all the goods in society, not just individual products like snow shovels or beach balls or cellos. Uh, we study all those things put together. Because we do, that presents some unique problems, both with measurement and graphing. When we study the overall aggregate value of something, we don't actually look at uh, necessarily the individual quantity of those goods or services. Uh, we look at the value and the market value of those goods and services in the macro economy. When we study whether that value goes up or down, we're not looking at necessarily a dollar amount, but whether the value inflates or deflates and what impact that has on the macro economy. So it will look different, and we'll get more into that in our next topic with aggregate demand and aggregate supply. But the important takeaway is we're looking at the economy as a whole, and we use the word aggregate for that. When we study in macroeconomics, in, economists are looking at uh, unemployment and employment of resources, which is a unique term we'll get to a bit more later, whether the price level of goods in general in the economy is going up or down whether the economy is growing and how we'd measure that, and then how that growth and how that income is distributed among pop people in the economy. We can measure or we can affect those changes through things called fiscal, monetary, and supply size policy, again, which will come up more throughout this big unit. If we're looking at overall economic activity, it's best understood with the open model of, uh, uh, the open circular flow model of an economy. Now, on the next slide, you should have seen this closed model before when we talked about mac or microeconomics. Uh, if you want to pause the video and take a look at this, this should be something that looks familiar. But on this new model, this open model, we have to take into account that at the country level, we have unique expenditures and uh, injections. Uh, we have, I'm sorry, we have unique uh, leakages and injections into and out of the economy. The leakages are things that are taken out of that circular flow model. Uh, you will see more of this in a particular screencast lecture for this model. But if you look on the left-hand side, you see things coming out of the household income. You see savings, taxes, and spending on imports, all that get sucked out of the economy. Uh, those are leakages. On the other side, you see uh, investments, government spending, and spending on exports coming back into our, our domestic economy. Uh, those are important parts of how we're going to measure overall economic activity. Again, there is much more on this particular graph in a different screencast. Why do we need to measure it and how would we measure it? Uh, there are some interesting ways about measuring overall economic performance. We could do it through output um, or we could do it through income. And both would give us very similar numbers, but an output approach would me measure the overall value of finished goods and services in a country over a period of time. Uh, we call that, and the way we're going to study it, is through gross domestic product. When we study the income approach, we measure all the money earned by, earned by the, the people, the workers, in the economy over a given period of time, and we can call that gross national income. Now, if we go back to the circular flow model, if we don't have any leakages and injections, the amount earned and the amount being spent should be very close to equal. But as we're going to find out, they're not. Let's take a look at GDP first. GDP is calculated with the equation consumer spending, C, plus in investment spending, I, plus government spending, G, plus the, the net exports, uh, exports minus imports. Um, that should be an 
x minus m, not i to be redundant there. Um, if we add up all those pieces, we get all the money spent on finished goods and services in an economy in a given year. GDP and GNI are, are different numbers. GDP is all the spending on a country's natural resources, but GNI is how much money is earned by all the income wage earners and residents in an economy. So, for instance, if a Apple iPhone is made in China, but there is a US worker in China who's working on the production of the iPhone, the US worker is receiving income as a US wage earner, as a US citizen, even though that person lives in another country, in this case, China. The wages earned by the US worker abroad counts toward US GNI, but the production of that iPhone counts toward the Chinese GDP. It counts towards their gross domestic product, but counts toward the US's GNI. And when you have foreign workers or companies that are, are making things abroad and then sending them back home domestically, we see a difference then in numbers of what GNI and GDP relate to. We can go through more examples of this if you want. Uh, Toyota products are manufactured and sold in the United States. Those account for US GDP. The income of a Japanese manager, perhaps of a Toyota plant in the United States, would count then back towards Japan's GNI. When we measure GNI and GDP, we have both real and nominal values. Nominal values are the measure of that, uh, of that value that particular year. So if you see nominal GDP, it's the GDP of that given year in that year's value, in that year's dollars, or in that year's euro. A real value, though, takes into account uh, a very important aspect. It takes into account the inflation or deflation of a country's currency over time. So if we're looking at GDP growth of a country, like India, from 1970 to 2015, and we use the nom nominal measures, it looks like India's GDP might be growing very, very quickly. But we have to remember that inflation is a component of what's causing the value of their money to go up. So whenever we try to compare GDP and GNI, we must remember to use the real value and not the nominal value, or else we're going to get a skewed statistic over time. Now, you will also see GDP and GNI reported as total GDP and GNI or per capita GDP in GNI. The per capita value divides the total amount by the entire population of a country. And again, using India as an example, the per capita GNI of India might be relatively low, even though their total GNI is quite high. Uh, India is a developing economy, but they have over 1 billion workers. So when comparing between countries, it's very important to, to make sure that we're looking at per capita GDP in GNI or else the comparisons are, are very uh, tricky to do. Now, I will tell you that GNI and GDP are not great measures. Uh, they are good, but they have lots of faults. And please know the IB asks you to know a lot about the faults of particular measures. Sorry about that. Uh, sometimes GNI and GDP actually don't measure output. So what are some examples of things that GDP doesn't actually measure? Um, things that aren't finished goods and services. If you have a manufacturing process that there's multiple steps uh, and your company does one step and then sells it to another company who then finishes the product, the in-between steps aren't measured in GDP. Okay? Neither are if you trade one good or service for another. So if a family member gives you something, uh, even though it's a, an exchange of wealth or value, there is no impact on GDP. If you make home improvements, if you redo your bathroom in your house, uh, even though, yes, you're paying for all the physical things that combine into redoing the bathroom, the overall value of the house that goes up because you've done that is not counted in GDP. Uh, if you have a backyard garden and you're growing fruits and vegetables, the money that you're saving or not spending on those, those goods in a marketplace, that is not counted in GDP. So these are small potatoes, no pun intended really there. Uh, these are small measures, but they do impact GDP. Uh, GDP also doesn't measure, if we're looking at the, the first component there of measuring output, they don't, under, they don't measure the underground or parallel markets, which in the United States we would call these black markets. Um, those components, things that are sold illegally, aren't caught in GDP. Uh, don't think about just the illegal or illicit uh, marketplace, but also think about um, somebody who sells their labor on, the, uh, on an illegal market. Uh, if you're babysitting and you're not paying taxes, that's not counted in GDP. 
and technically it's an underground market, you are selling your labor to somebody without it being officially recorded. Another thing that's not measured in total output, uh, why GDP is not a great measure, is if you make a quality improvement like buying new technology for your workplace. Buying that technology will allow your workplace to do even more things, uh, which might increase the total GDP, but the only thing that's measured is the amount of money you spent on the computer. A computer or a new machine or an assembly line might make a drastic amount of improvement on what you can do, but the only part of that investment that's counted in GDP is the actual physical buying of that process. Um, now let's look negative. Um, negative externalities are not factored into GDP either. So things like creating concrete. Uh, con concrete production is highly polluting, but those negative production assets or those negative production values aren't detracted or aren't subtracted from GDP. It's just the value of physically producing that finished good, that finished concrete. So GDP and GNI don't measure everything. Uh, they're far from it. They are a good measure of national, in national income or national production, but not perfect. Um, GDP and GNI actually don't measure standard of living either. Okay, So if a country only produces nuclear weapons, their GDP might be quite high, but it says nothing about the quality of life of people in that country. If a country is making improvements in education and health, but those improvements in education and health do not impact the overall performance of the country yet, um, you don't see any bump or improvement in GDP or GNI right away, but uh, guaranteed if you're improving people's education, then uh, five or ten years down the road, their national income or their individual income that contributes then to national income will be higher. So we don't see these standard of living improvements um, that are included in GNI and GDP. Uh, they don't measure how much money you spend on leisure activity. So how you spend your money isn't measured at all. It's just measuring what money is there. Uh, very important for our course, GDP and GNI actually don't measure real value of, I'm sorry, they, they don't measure accurately and you can't compare um, impact over time. Uh, what do I mean by that? You have to use the real values of a country, which is important so you negate the inflation, but you also can't compare accurately um, China's growth to India's growth to the United States' growth over time because all you can show is that one country is growing one way but you can't say that one country's growth significantly in one year is better than another country's growth in that particular year because you can't compare one country's growth to another uh, just by looking at GDP. There are other ways of doing that, and GDP gives you an idea of how to do that, but you can't make absolute conclusions about the country's growth based on uh, GDP or GNI alone. And the last one I want to bring up relates to something else that we just said about negative externalities above, Neither GDP or GNI actually account for environmental issues, environmental sustainability, which leads us to the Lorax and green GDP. Now, because GDP and GNI do not accurately account for those negative externalities, economists have come up with a measure called green GDP. If you think about a country like China, who's industrializing very quickly, but has loads of pollution while doing it, uh, the measure of green GDP tries to subtract out from the total GDP, if you look at the third bullet point, from the total GDP, they try to subtract out the value of environmental degradation and the expense to clean up environmental problems. So China's one example. Uh, we see in the news quite a bit about the pollution in Beijing. But if you want to look at a more uh, relevant U.S. example, when there are oil spills in the Gulf of Mexico, the oil that's being produced uh, counts to the GDP, but what is not subtracted out is actually the environmental cleanup. In fact, the environmental cleanup adds to the GDP if you think about it. Um, the, envi the, the value of how much is lost from the environment because of the environmental degradation isn't counted in. So if we are truly to measure green GDP, we should subtract out the, the value of the environment that's damaged because of production of these goods and subtract out the expenses from cleaning them up and not add the expenses to the GDP. That's an important issue. Um, you will not see that number come up a whole lot but it's an important way of trying to make GDP more accurate, especially as we see the difference between developing and developed countries. Now, HL students will do some calculations about how you calculate GNI, GDP, uh, real GDP using a price index, uh, and how we can, can show some of that. It's very easy math that we'll do at a separate point. I'd like to end, though, with what the business cycle is. Uh, the business cycle is a way of demonstrating economic growth over a period of time. So if we're trying to show how well a country is doing, 
we can use something like this. And again, since this is a graph that you will see more of, you'll see a bit more detail in another, another slideshow later. In this case, on the vertical axis, you see that we have real GDP, and over the horizontal axis, we see time measured in years. And as we see, uh, countries generally grow and shrink over a period of years, but if you look at a trend line, a trend line, you see that little dotted line that goes across, across the graph, there is a general upward tend trend of growth in almost every country around the world. Um, if you look at some of the labels there, there's more to how this is going to fit together. Um, the little labels there are important right now, uh, and we're going to see them become more complex as we get into macroeconomic issues. So again, going back particularly to this slide, you will see more of this as we progress into economics, but you need to know now that the business cycle is a good way of measuring all of that. Now just to end, I want to go back to all we try to do today is an overview of overall economic activity. There are some pros and cons to it. Um, there's loads of measures that you can use, but what you need to take away is that we're trying to measure the overall state of an economy. We have to use aggregate numbers, and when we do, we don't get anything that's very precise. We get very big numbers that have all sorts of potential problems.